So today we have Jesse Frost, and some of you may be familiar with him already um, as a kind of famous no-till grower. Um, he recently came out with the No-Till Grower's Guide to Living Soil, which is a great resource. Um, it's kind of the living soil handbook, so um, we are excited to talk about the principles and kind of dive into what the book is all about and how it can benefit you growers. Um, so first off, what are the three principles to farm by that you talk about? Well, the, the three principles, they kind of come from conservation agriculture, are keep the soil covered as much as possible, keep it planted as much as possible, and disturb it as little as you possibly can. Um, there's also a fourth one or maybe even a fifth one, depending on who you talk to. Uh, the fourth one would be biodiversity, just as much diversity as possible. And the fifth one would be, um, you know, animal integration. And those things are fine. I kind of mix both of those into those. So I kind of consolidated a little bit for the book. Um, but those are fine, too. There's several more that people could to, just could use as well. But um, those are the primary. Absolutely. Awesome. As a no-till market gardener yourself, um, definitely seeking to promote soil life and biology in the soil, what have been some of the most uh, inspiring and encouraging growing results that you've experienced? Oh, our, you know, when we stopped tilling and started doing better mulching and, and being more um, conscious of what we were doing to the soil and how we were treating the soil health, keeping it planted a lot, um, we just saw a rebound in the quality of the crops that we were growing. We saw a, a massive decrease in the number of weeds that we were having to deal with. Uh, to the point that we, you know, I forget how much time we spent weeding. And now when I talk to other farmers who do cultivation, it's it's surprising. It's shocking. Um, moisture retention is better. Uh, just the soil in general is happier. It's very pliable. I can get into it in the, you know, in the middle of the winter time. Um, and uh, just because there's no mud, there's no, it's not, it's, it's, it's very easy for me to, to be able to use it whenever I need to. I can keep it planted at all times. Um uh, yeah, and it's just a more enjoyable way of farming. It's less toil. It's less fighting with machinery. It's less, um, you know, a lot of times we still use our BCS tractor, a little walk behind tractor, but we're not doing nearly as much with it. So it's less greasing. It's less, you know, fuel, fossil fuels, all the things that we want to try and avoid. Um, it's just been almost exclusively benefits. Now it's not without its challenges, but many, many benefits have come along. So you kind of already talked about a little bit of the labor saving, which is huge for especially people who are trying to grow organically and are battling, battling weeds. Um, but other than the labor saving benefits, um, what has some of the most exciting benefits been um, as far as actually feeding the soil, the photosynthesis that you talk about? Yeah, so we see um, a lot of soil organic matter being produced we just moved to a new farm so we're kind of redoing this from a new angle which is fun uh has 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 been great to see those same results repeated um in a different property on different soil but when, at our old farm that we were at for four years kind of implementing these sort of systems um we started to see soil organic matter getting deeper and deeper into the soil um which means that our carbon sequestration of so to speak was was increasing and getting deeper and deeper um and uh generally just the the pliability of the soil the air that's in it just it it feels uh it went from being kind of dense and rocky kind of clay um to being kind of fluffy and and really easy to deal with but also just great for the for the roots to get around in and for the for the um you know uh, macro life the worms and etc um and there's also benefits that are less easy to track just i mean it's not necessarily less easy to track you get a little bit of yield benefit um and you know disease pressure goes down pest pressure maybe goes down um those sorts of things we've been able to see ourselves on our own farm uh but then there's also just like the joy of being out there and the joy of not having to um you know deal with dust and deal with uh you know cultivation in the middle of the sun like this is for most people farming is just cultivation uh you know it's a lot of uh out there with a hoe and you're you're kind of in the middle of the sun on a hot day and that's what your labor is going towards that's what everybody is doing because they're having to beat back the weeds so that you have a good productive crop when you take that out of it you get to do so much more uh so much more that you want to do you know we do a lot with uh making our own compost and making our own compost teas and doing the stuff that we enjoy like being involved with the soil um so i you know i think the benefits i don't want to oversell it but i don't know how not to so um, it's, yeah, I mean, I think the benefits for us have just been uh, almost unlimitless. 
Yeah, I mean, you base like a whole, you have a whole podcast the, based on like the principles of not tilling. You have like a website that's dedicated to it. I think that it's like, I mean, you're growing um, with speaking with people yourself with like that are practicing this. And I think that one of the things I've noticed you say a bunch of times is basically that there's no very clear definition of what is tillage. And so I think that, um, and that you even say like in, with your principles, you always end it with as little as possible. You're not kind of creating like a mandate that no till like at all or whatever. I feel like that you, um, are kind of coming about it from really hearing people's stories. And so we are wanting to ask you how you define tillage. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, for me, tillage is the thing to define and not no-till. When you start defining no-till, it gets too limiting. So tillage is definitely the place to start because um, when we think about what we're trying to avoid, uh, we have to look at kind of how far tillage has come, what it's evolved to be. You know, a long time ago, uh, to where it developed, you know, if you look at in dictionary now, it says the tillage uh, is to prepare the soil for growing crops. And but I don't think anybody, if we stopped and thought, like, what do you think of the word tillage? I don't think any of us would just stop there. I think we'd add something negative in there. I think we'd say, uh, but it also can be harmful to soil life or it can be, you know, cause erosion. It causes the dust bowl and those sorts of things. And so dictionaries often lag behind popular cultures or popular definitions. So I think the more updated version, the version that involves that, that involves, you know, like chemical agriculture and what's that, what that's done to soil and plowing is, you know, and I believe in what I consider and what I posit is that tillage is anything we do that causes long-term harm to the soil. And no-till is not necessarily just avoiding those things. It's actively working to improve soil health. So, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, t tillage doesn't have to, I think one of the big things that happens is tillage is often conflated with disturbance. But disturbance isn't inherently a bad thing, right? Just the soil is being disturbed all the time. So earthworms and bacteria and fungi and plant roots and uh, moles and voles and, and everything is moving through the soil constantly, right? And that's good. In a good, healthy soil, it should be moving. It should almost be churning at a very, very slow pace, but it should be moving. Um, and so humans can take part in that too. Just be, every one of our disturbances doesn't have to be negative. We have to think that our role can be positive. And it has been for thousands of years before, you know, chemical agriculture and really conventional agriculture, our role with the soil was really positive. Um, we stewarded it and that's kind of what we have to get back to. So when I think of no-till, it's about addressing what your soil needs. Like you said, like you've talked about as much as possible. It's all about your context, address what your soil needs in your context and work from that. And it may involve a little disturbance up front. But it may also mean that you can back off over time and you're slowly generating good and healthier soil that can not sustain itself entirely on its own because the steward, you know, it is helpful to have the stewards around, um, but that can, uh, that can be robust and isn't constantly losing carbon, isn't constantly losing topsoil. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to make that concise because I think it's such an important conversation to have when you... Because I think that a lot of people, when they look at the idea of no-till, they think, oh, these are the only practices I can do. Instead of saying, this is what my soil needs, how can I address that? And then what can I do to, to promote long-term soil health, which is what I think of as no-till. I think that's such a great answer and um, one that definitely should be um, changed in the dictionary in the future because, um, I mean, people just don't talk about it like that. And I think that it can be kind of daunting and inhibiting for a lot of growers to feel so limited or tied into a box thinking about just the mechanisms rather than the holistic perspective sort of of what they're doing to the soil. So I think too, the no-till on a commercial scale is often paired with the heavy use of um, mm -hmm. herbicides and like chemicals and things like that. And we noticed that your farm is certified organic. Um, and we were kind of wanting to ask you that question too, like the same as that you said, the principles might have thrown like biodiversity and other things. Do you think it's equally important for healthy living soil, uh, specifically with like no-till to pair with organic practices? I do think it's essential. And I think it's essential because when we think about the things that can cause that form of tillage, that long-term 
harmful soil health. It isn't just the plow. It isn't just tillers and spaders and et cetera. It's also chemicals. Chemicals have led to erosion. They've led to massive die-offs in microbial populations, uh, macro and you know fauna and uh, just everything. Um, so when we think about what tillage is, it, it isn't just the tools that we typically think of. It can be anything. Anything can cause tillage. Compaction causes tillage in a way. Like it slows down. It really, really limits plant productivity. Um, so all of those things, driving heavy machinery onto your soil, all of that can be, can, you know, can be uh, uh, tillage. So we want to kind of avoid that. And so it sort of leads toward these ideas of using uh, more organic methods. And it doesn't have to be certified organic. I, I think there's there's reasonable um, skepticism with the, with the organic certification. But the I think that the idea of using non-chemical, more biological, uh, more uh, natural proteins for your nitrogen and uh, those sorts of things and, and much more, you know, more mulching, less plastic mulching, more organic mulching, those sorts of things. Um, those are, yeah, those are, I think so. I mean, I think they pair really well together. They almost feel, you know, like a, a natural hand in hand. It almost feels like you can't really do tillage without those, without that other side, or you can't really do no tillage without that other side of it. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree, especially when you come back to your point that you made about it really all coming back to the living soil. Mm -hmm. that if you're starting, if you're not tilling, but you're using, you know, tons of herbicides to keep the weeds at bay, yeah. you're not helping the soil stay alive. So it's really, it really does come back to those guiding principles mm -hmm. that you covered, I think are really great to keep people on track with what the point is it's not just about certifications there's a lot of new language of regenerative regenerative organic uh, no-till and like people are trying to understand what that means for them specifically what as a consumer and a grower but um, I think that mm -hmm. those things are still being defined but it doesn't mean you have to be certified one way to understand that those are the principles you should be following mm -hmm. Um, for, for the benefit of the soil and, and, and people's health and everything, which I get is, um, not always easy for people that are actually market gardeners and people that like you are growing, not just as a hobby, but, or for your family, but actually trying to take into consideration yields and, um, profits and all of that to stay alive. That, um, as far as that goes, um, what have you found would be a really good way to actually, if you're just getting started and trying to switch to grow more no-till organic, what would you recommend in terms of installing a market garden um, for beginners? Yeah, you know, I think it, it, it really starts with measuring what your context is, what kind of, what, what are you actually working with, which involves what level of compaction are you working with? Um, what level of soil organic matter are you working with? Uh, what is your climate? What kind of, what is your market going to look like? Like, what are the crops that you're going to grow? Um, and some of those things all, you know, in the book, I try and make it this sort of choose your own adventure. That was my idea for the book. And it's not exactly that. I would love to write one of those one day, but it's not exactly that. But the idea being that this isn't just like a copy and paste version of here's how I do things on my farm. Here's how you can do it. You know, with the book, I tried to be like, this is how soil works. And so it works that way anyway. Here's some ideas based on your context of how to, to, to manage that. So let's say in a situation where um, you know, cause everybody's context is going to be different. Some people may be able to just throw cardboard down in some really nice compost and plant into that and be fine. Have like a no dig sort of Charles D Dowding style bed. Um, but some people that's not going to work right away. It depends on the quality of your compost, uh, depends on the compaction that you're dealing with. If you're dealing with really heavy, heavy compaction below that soil, be below that, um, compost and stuff that may actually set you back a year or two to really get it going. So especially if you're not willing to do some broad forking or work at that soil, uh, and it may be a situation where you actually wanted to go in and do a primary tillage with some work, some compost into the soil. And then that'd be the last time you do that. But it gets that compaction broken up a little bit. It gets you, your plant roots something to go into that's not just like mucky clay. Um, so context is hugely important. I mean, I think, you know, well, I always tell farmers, like, look at what you're working with first. Like, don't look at the, the methods that everybody's doing. Like, look at what you're working with first and then start diving into the methods and seeing which which ones make sense. And, you know, if somebody's transitioning, start small. Like, just trial some things, see if they work for you because your access to compost, for to use that example, because that's a very popular one, may not be as high quality as mine and or somebody else's. So you may end up with really bad compost and that could be devastating to your crops. Um, 
you know, it's all, it, you really just have to know what you're working with. So that, that to me is the biggest one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think with back to Eden, when we made it, we definitely didn't realize that we were going to be putting out a film that was going to make everyone go and put wood chips like all over the ground because Paul really comes from the place of, um, I mean, he does that for sure, but he also grows in rocks and he grows in like other mulching materials. And he's very much like whatever you have that's local and available to you, like go look, it might not be wood chips and that, but he comes back to it being the principle, your second principle, keep the soil covered as much as possible, or basically always. And um, his opinion is like, you have to keep soil covered, period, with basically whatever you have access to. Um, and so we were kind of curious to ask you, what do you cover your soil with? What's your favorite uh, material to mulch with? Yeah, so I, for our context, we do, we're hot. Like it's a very hot climate here in Kentucky. In the middle of the summer, it gets to be, you know, roughly 100 degrees, 100% humidity. It's It can be really intense for several weeks in the summer. You know, oftentimes it's in that 85 to 95 range, but it gets really warm for very long periods. And, um, and so for us, certain mulches don't always make as much sense as other mulches. Um, we want light colored mulches in the middle of the summer, straws and hay. Uh, in the spring and fall, we want the darker colored mulches. So we actually do a rotation of those as much as we can, where we're doing lighter colored stuff around stuff that needs cooler soil, or we're doing, we do a lot of cover cropping too. So that's a great kind of lighter colored mulch. Um, and then darker colored mulches for the spring and the, you know, when we can, when it makes sense, we'll put down uh, several inches of compost just as a soil warmer, just to keep it, um, uh, you know, a little bit, get it a little bit warmer for our early spring crops and then into the fall and into the winter. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a tool in the toolbox mulch, right? Is just figuring out where to put it and how to use it. Um, and I, I agree, like several soil should be covered at all times, but not every mulch always makes sense all the time. So it, for me, it just, it's about mixing it up and about, um, you know, using it strategically. Uh, but no, I, I think that, you know, you're, especially in arid climates, um, you know, when you read that moisture is so important, keeping that soil covered is huge. Like that's, I mean, it's, the, it's a difference maker and it also feeds the microbial life and creates soil organic matter and the fungal life. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hugely important, hugely important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned, um, cover crops being one of the kind of living mulches of the soil that, um, are super effective. What are some of the, um, your recommended or your favorite, um, at least in your region, from your experience, living mulches or cover crops that you've worked with? Yeah, so we do a few different things with sort of living mulch idea. Um, we do living pathways, which tend to be dominated in clovers and that sort of thing. But the grasses, the native grasses tend to take over, but we keep those mowed and keep the beds edged. And that's the closest thing we've sort of found to what you'll hear popularly, like the perennial cover crops, um, something that you would just be ground cover and you'd plant into that. We haven't had any success doing that. What we've had most success with is the uh, living pathways. So that's one way we use living plant roots kind of in the soil at all times. That also helps in our context to shed water we have very wet climate here. Um, so oftentimes we're getting this past year, we got four inch rainfall in four hours. And that's the kind of thing that has to be moved out of your garden. But if you have bare soil pathways or even wood chips in our case, they just float off because it's so much rain. Um, so the living pathways have been really good for that for us. And so that's one way. Um, then in terms of like cover cropping, uh, we use those very strategically too. Like if we want um, we use a lot of summer cover crops for like our garlic, for instance, we'll do a nice summer cover crop, we'll tarp it and then we'll pull it off, we'll plant our garlic and then we'll kind of add a little bit of mulch over top of that. Um, or, uh, let's say we want, uh, you know, our sweet potatoes right now, they have a rye vetch crimson clover cover crop that'll go all winter. Uh, we'll kill that in the spring and then we'll plant our sweet potatoes into that. Um, We'll actually add a little bit of mulch over top too, just because, you know, cover crops, they tend to break down in our climate because it's so warm. We're like semi subtropical. So that, that microbial life is very active. It can break down a cover crop pretty quickly. Um, so we want to add a little bit of extra mulch over top of that. Um, or you could do, uh, you know, we also have a couple beds or a couple plots that we did in like a winter kill cover crop. So that was like a mixture of summer stuff and then peas and oat. Uh, we didn't do oats this year because they don't always reliably winter kill here. Um, but 
we did peas and several other like summer cover crops and those grow up pretty tall. They die and then you get a nice little mulch over the winter and you can sort of rake that off in the spring and plant. So um, as long as you know what you want from your cover crop, I think that uh, they're, they're really great. They're just so good for, there's almost nothing better for the soil than a plant that grows and dies there. And then you can, then you can plant something right after it that just as much photosynthesis as possible always. Right. I think that's so true that a lot of times like people are just like, oh, just cover the soil. And we're like, no, you have to plant in it. Like you've got to put plants in it to make the whole cycle work. And so I think that that's something that is um, I love that that was your third principle that to plant things, basically, that you can't just stop tilling and cover the soil and everything's going to be great. <laughs> right. I mean, we have to, you know, if the, if you're not feeding the soil, if it's not uh, photosynthesizing, right, we're not drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil, it's feeding on itself. So that can be, that's fine for things like, you know, wood chips and those sorts of things that are wasted carbonaceous materials to get those back into the soil. That's great. Like we should be doing that, but we also have to be feeding it. You know, we can't just be using up the carbon. We also have to be putting it back into the soil. Um, so yeah, combo of those things I think is, is, yeah, it's, it's hugely important. Yeah. Kind of what is your hope for the living soil handbook of, in terms of how it will impact, um, farmers and gardeners and uh, what you kind of want them to like walk away with as their main message or main um, thing that they go and do after reading your book. Yeah, I hope that people look at, you know, pick up that book and read it and kind of get some tips, maybe feel a little bit of freedom from the dogma. I think that that's really important, just not feeling like it, you know, tillage is one thing or no till is one thing and it's not this other thing, you know, whatever I want people to be able to address their com their soil and their context, because I think that's going to be the best for everybody. Um, I also think it's going to, you know, I hope that they see a reduction in their weeds and in the labor that they're putting into, to managing weeds, right? The soil all, weeds are just, a, it's, I always call them the emergency solar panels. They're just, they're the soil telling you that it needs energy. And, you know, as the farmer, we're often just out there knocking them down. Want to, Instead, find methods that don't send up the emergency soil, sol solar panels, right? That, that aren't trying to say like, hey, we need energy, like feed, you know, instead find things that are feeding the soil and making it happy. Um, and yeah, I just hope that, uh, I hope that people get a little bit of um, a different view of what agriculture can be and what market gardening can be. And um, it's, it's, and also just walk away with a little bit of an understanding of how so soil and plants work together. Uh, that's one thing I really wanted to focus on the book is like kind of describing what photosynthesis is and how it can work for you. And, um, because I think, you know, as farmers, that's what we do. We manage photosynthesis. So we, the better our understanding of that is, doesn't have to be super technical. Even scientists don't know everything about photosynthesis. Um, but the more we know, the better we can utilize that. We can understand how sunlight works and how we as growers interact with sunlight and carbon dioxide and water and nutrients and microbes um, to improve their their uptake in the plant. And um, yeah, so all of those things. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great book. We really recommend that people go and check it out. There's definitely something for everyone and a lot of new information that I hadn't um, actually heard of as well, um, considering how much that we have kind of delved into some of this. So um, yeah, I, I was just going to ask it. like on a personal note too, what did you, what do you think of back to Eden and Paul Gauchi and the method that's kind of taken off from that film? Oh, I think, I think you were right in your assessment that a lot of people have just spread wood chips everywhere, but I don't think that his method is bad. Like in, in fact, when I was reading about it on his site, he talks about, um, you know, using compost underneath of the wood chips, uh, which I think is important. You need that nitrogenous balance. Um, and I think he, you know, he recognized that too. Um, but I don't, I think that sometimes gets missed when being translated to the backyard gardener or somebody that uh, wants to do this method um, because it, it can be a little bit of a nitrogen hog depending on how you use wood chips. Um, but if you have them, they're amazingly nutritious, like finding a way to employ them in your garden. We often use them in our compost. We will use them in our pathways in the tunnels where they're not going to wash out. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think if you can use wood chips, find a place for them. Absolutely. They're wonderful. Uh, so there's a place for that. Yeah. But like, I, I think you figure that out if you're, you know, as you develop your context, if it's the right one for you. No, and I love too, how you, you, um, have in like your introduction, I believe in the book where it's like, Paul never is like, 
I am the one that created this and I'm the first and like only that he definitely never claims anything like along those lines. And I think that what you said, it's like really the let's look back in history. Let's look at what other cultures were doing. That's like this is, you know, this isn't something that's like new. This is actually just returning back to mimicking nature and, and growing food how nature was meant to be. So mm -hmm. I definitely think that we align with like everything that you have in the book and um, the information that you shared. So we really appreciated that you put that out into the world for um, helping people transform their way that they're growing food. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. And um, there's so much more that I could talk about with you of like the mm -hmm. specific um, crops, even like you talk about carrots and these certain mm -hmm. things that actually help um, transform the soil. I thought that was kind of, um, you know, something that not everybody is talking about that mm -hmm. I'd like to at least briefly touch on before we end the conversation. Yeah. So there's, um, you know, some of the things that I think about with like how to utilize plants to improve your soil. I mean, cover crops can be incredibly useful for that. Um, and there, and then there's also the crops that can do it as well, but just to touch on cover crops a little bit more, uh, you know, you have cover crops that send out really deep tap roots. And so they help break up your compaction. They help to sort of mine nutrients from the soil. They help to feed the microbial life and bloom those populations. Um, you know, for instance, buckwheat, really fast grower, great cover crop, good for outrunning weeds. Um, also good for gathering microbes, good for gathering phosphorus. Um, you know, so you can use these cover crops sort of strategically. You can get, you know, the famous one obviously is legumes that fix nitrogen. If your soil is low in nitrogen, maybe you can use some legumes. Maybe you can throw in some rye to help with your weed populations. Um, it's almost like a cocktail that you can you can put together to to improve your soil. And there's other ones like lacy phacelia is really good for soil condition, like it improves the quality of your soil, the tilt of your soil. Um, and, you know, all the, you can just kind of, you, you know, uh, use them as you need them and for what you need them for. Um, and then there's, yeah, definitely crops. Uh, one of the things that, and this isn't exactly what you were asking about, but one of the things I dedicate a lot of the book to is interplanting, um, because the value of having that diversity, right. Uh, having multiple species in the bed at the same time. So an example of that would be like tomato plants with lettuce on the side or beets on the side, um, peppers and onions. I love planting green onions in my peppers. Um, and the, that gives you an economic benefit because those green onions are faster than the peppers. They'll grow faster. You'll get that crop out of that bed uh, before the peppers are ready. Um, so it's not just wasted time. But then also there's the, you know, the benefits of having the, you know, a second, uh, uh, another species pumping in different exudates, gathering different microbial life. Um, so that's another thing is it's it just how you use your crops um, can be you know, provide a lot of biodiversity to your soil and to your, to your income. Um, and then, yeah, lots of different crops. One I think is, is carrots. Uh, carrots are much easier to grow in a no-till system than they are in a tillage system because as your weed populations go down, your competition goes down for, for successful carrots. And as you pull each one of those carrots out, they've spent the last, you know, 50, 70 days just pumping carbon into your soil. Then you pull it out, it leaves a little air pocket, which is good. You need good gas exchange for your soil to be functional. And uh, you get this nice, you know, carbohydrate that is just rich with nutrients and and beta carotene and all the things that we need. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, those those crops are are there's so many of them. But, yeah, I do. I think seven or eight in the book um, and just kind of talk about how to do them in a market garden context and then why they're good in a no till context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that, that would just be a, a tasty little sneak peek for mm -hmm. people because like it's those type of bits of information that people are going to want to go and learn more about and um, with the interplanting and the specific crops, how they can affect your soil in a way that mm -hmm. most people don't really think about. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, it's it's some carrots are definitely one that people are always having trouble with uh, getting started in general, so being such a small seed. So uh, I thought that that was a really important piece of information because, uh, you know, people shy away from wanting to try them because they think that it's too difficult. And ironically, that you would think they, you know, some people have told us you can't grow carrots in a no-till system, like the complete opposite. So I love the experience of actually being like, well, I've done this and this is easier, actually. <laughs> but um, so I thought yeah. that was important. Yeah. yeah, huge crop for us. and. I, and that's one of those things. It's about your how, what system you set up. It wouldn't be carrots are not great in a straw or hay mulch system, but in a compost system where compost is your main mulch, they're much easier to do. 
Um, and they're, they're, it's almost a no brainer. They're, they're significantly easier and they get the moisture they need for seven to 14 days. Um, and they don't have the weed pressure. It's great. Well, it's awesome. Like we said that we could go on and on with all the little bits of information that, um, but we'll leave some of it to, um, up to people having to get your book to find out more. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to say thank you. And, um, we encourage all of the viewers to go and, look up the no-till growers and uh, follow the podcast mm -hmm. and, you know, just get connected. <laughs> so thank yeah. you so much. Well, thank you all. Thank you all so much for having me on and letting me talk about the book. And I, I really enjoyed it.